Um, the nice thing about TED is that, you know, it's for the first time in many years created a forum for celebrating ideas at the, in its quintessence. And uh, all of this week, Monday through Friday, I was in a workshop with about 26 students and young professionals from about 12 countries, all of them trying to see what on earth they can do more than figuratively to understand sustainability and how to carve careers and paths in these directions that the world needs so desperately but the markets don't seem to actually want to understand. When Arvind spoke to me, Arvind Dutta spoke to me some two months ago about this, I told myself that there must be something that we can tell you that captures the story of how we began what we wanted to begin in 94 or 95. The kind of, the sort of resistance that we met with in the, in the marketplace how we did the transition from being a non-government organization, working toward those same goals that, let us say, the million, Millennium Development Goals works for, and yet, you know, seeking to see how it continues to be profitable as an enterprise. These are some grim figures that uh, came to me actually a little later in life, sometime around 2003, when uh, I began to see that you know, this process of urbanization, May 23rd, 2008, for the first time we had more than 50% of our people in urban agglomerations. Actually, if you look at it, across the world today, no more than this 2% of land mass. In India, it's a little more, as you can see here. Stay in these places called cities. That's where the challenge is. I don't have to tell you anything more than those grim figures tell you. One of those guys who was with me this last week was a guy called Michael Corsi from Dartmouth College, somewhere in New Hampshire. And the man was saying that, you know, if there is any single thing that's happened to us in the last, say, 30 years, it is this very spasmodic, you know, kind of shift in the way that we abuse natural resources. I mean, we are standing in a place that's, that was truly inspirational. Taramati was you know, one of the singers who must have done this in a, in a beautiful, naturally acoustic setting where the Nawab possibly sat atop the fort and she sang from here. And that kind of serenading could be heard without mics, without energy, without any of these things that we use today. So there's been this shift in the last, say, 200 years of this industrial society that we have kind of led ourselves into, where we have moved away from natural energy flow systems into these released energy flow systems. Like someone said, was that, was that this guy who uh, wrote Natural Capitalism called Paul Haw Hawkins. There has been this uh, carbon sellout, a, a massive billion year carbon sellout that's happened in the last 30 years, decimating, actually decimating and collapsing all forms of architecture of water and energy that the world has had, civilizations have had for the last 5,000 years. We are no more than 5,000 years actually. The last ice age was 10,000 years ago. So what you have before us is a, is a serious crisis and we don't actually want to see it. Whether it's Al Gore or some of those professionals who spoke in that eminently evocative film that uh, Leonard, Leonard of DiCaprio made called The Eleventh Hour, you saw the story of the earth unfolding in the next say 50 years in ways that you and I don't want to see it happen. Look at that, three calories a day, current sun is all you need for life sustenance. 225,000 calories a day is our current urban per capita. And look at the pressure that India is facing. It's too much, way too much. Even China doesn't have the kind of challenge that we have got. And this one trillion that we have reached from 1991 to now is going to take us to the next, two, you know, the next trillion is going to happen in less than 15 years. And can you imagine what will happen to all the coal and the oil and the gas? What, what you see as reserves go today? What you are seeing today as resistance, whether it is, you know, in Odisha, or whether it's in Ratnagiri district, or those things that are happening in, uh, in other parts to the north, they are all parts, they are all presaging a certain kind of future that we all need to contend with, make our businesses work to overcome them. Buildings that have sought green certification, look at this, this is again one more procedure of the kind of future that is to come about. We are, we are about to touch a billion square feet, of so that's a million million square feet of such buildings by the end of this year. It started, we set this as a vision sometime in 2006. 
it's taken us no more than five years now to reach this point. And it's not been reached because somebody made an effort. It's not been reached because we set some kind of a vision objective. No. It's come about because the building industry began to see it. Businesses have begun to see it. It was Kofi Annan who said that nobody is asking us to do different businesses. We need to do business differently. That's, that's I think, the, you know, the kind of uh, shift that we need to make in the conversation in any uh, boardroom. Given that, and given what we have ourselves sought to do in the last, say, 15 or 16 years, I thought I'd take you through the sort of challenges we faced in the marketplace and what we did to, to see that we tell the customer that this is what you will get and you've got to live with it. Um, we built today, we built, we built about 2 million square feet, we're building about 0.8 million square feet just now across uh, some cities, and we don't use any of these things. No bricks, no clay blocks, no clay tiles, no ceramic or vitrified tiles. I'm not going to read the rest of it. We don't have geysers in our homes. We don't use, of course, anything that's chemical based. All homes that we uh, create are air-conditioned. Office spaces that we create are air-conditioned. But they are non-HCFC, non-CFC, non-ODS, as in ozone depleting. Uh, we don't use chemical-based paints. We've stopped using plaster as much as we can in places. So, the, you know, the inevitable question is, so what do you do? How do you build these homes? What is it? For instance, you know, look at that last one. We've stopped using pure cement. We use only composite cements now. And composite is going to be the future. I'll show you some things later as to how that makes a difference. Right now, right now, meaning in the last month and a half or two, we have started work with, uh, some, uh, with, with something called the Oak Ridge National Labs in Tennessee. And these guys are fascinated with these approaches where we upcycle and not just recycle products in ways that we can make composite materials that can be used in the construction sector. The construction sector, you must remember, uses up about 35% of all energy that we generate every year. One third. You see this. The important thing is that Whatever be your innovation or integration of innovation, you need to see that you're not costing your customer more. Your sale price has to be the same. Well, of course, your bottom line has to remain protected. Now, how do you manage that? How do you give, therefore, those extra features in terms of financial savings that the customer seeks and you can promise and deliver? Um, this is one such project. We used laterite here, we used a lot of non-retaining walls, our climate modification systems, we, use about, we have about 30 or 35 architects who work on what is called microclimate and energy simulation model systems. We are constantly working on, look at, look at the humidity here today, it's dry and yet humid. You must be having something like say 60%. Air conditioning is not working too well, but the idea is to see that you're air is stirred, that is the velocity of the temp, you know, of, of, of in, inside the room is kept, while you know, you're not really working on the temperature. It's a decent way of doing sometimes. We've gone with bamboo in many cases, homes which bring, now these are, you know, at general spaces, railings we have moved away from steel, we have moved from fossil resources, we have moved to uh, you know, building with uh, soil stabilized blocks. This is this this one that I'm showing you has about uh, 550,000, nearly 600,000 blocks. All of them made on site at nearly the same cost as any other building will cost you, and with no compromise on time of delivery, and with the customers uh, whatever objective also being met without any um, aggravation for, for 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 the for the marketplace. Those floors there are coconut husk based. Most often we have tried to see that we remain with natural stones and materials of these kinds. And those roads don't use asphalt, they don't use concrete. They have stayed for 15 years in some cases. We're just now doing about 60 kilometers of such roads and we're finding them, you know, with, with, uh, with nearly 70% being construction debris that we use for those roads as far as subgrades go. Uh, our air conditioning systems have, you know, combined ammonia, with uh, earth tunnel heat exchange systems where we go down. You know, in these parts, for instance, during the time of the Nizams, the early Nizams, 18th century, they used such systems where they went down about four meters to see how they could capture 
average temperatures in those parts. In fact, if you went to Amir, you'll find the fort has a water cooling temperature, a water cooling air conditioning system in the Diwan e Khan. Uh, what we're doing, therefore, is you know, kind of understanding traditional knowledge, respecting it for what they have represented, and blending it with contemporary engineering. These walls, for instance, are externally earth plastered, and internally uh, they've used a kind of a buttress to see that we don't have to plaster it inside, so they remain exposed. And on top, you can see those wind ventilators. Keep circulation up, rooms remain cool. Swimming pools like these, we have built about 12 or 13 swimming pools. We're just now building two more in different uh, projects. They never use tiles. They don't use chemical-based processes for treatment of water. Here, in this one, we have used ionizing, and we have also used something called ozonating. It sparkles the water, and it doesn't give you the red eye you know, that you usually have when you have chlorine dosed manually or otherwise. You can see that in each of these cases, the aesthetic has been protected. Cost and time had to be protected for the sake of the company and for the sake of the customer too. These are all external walls that are not plastered, yet they look good. You don't have to do anything. If you're a resident of any of these projects or any of these buildings, you don't really have to paint them. I keep telling people that you don't need to actually be going green. I think we should stop celebrating all these wonderful days, the World Environment Day, World Water Day and such things. All you need to actually do is to see if you can do a few of these things in your own homes. It's so simple, actually. There are, there's a set of six strands that we talk about. Many of these things are things that you can do in your own home. To get rid of that geezer in, that, in your house, for instance, or to knock away those, many of you would have done this, you know, knock away those CFLs, I mean, knock away those incandescents and put in these CFLs in place in a way that you can get up to about 80%. I know that there are questions that people have. What's the lifetime? Why should I pay six to seven times more? you know, on a system and so on. But you're seeing a shift. I was in Sri Lanka some time ago. I was in Brunei recently. In Malaysia, in Thailand, in nearly all these countries in the ASEAN, they have stopped using incandescents. You will see them in London, in northern parts of London, for instance. But you don't see them anywhere in Asia these days. They've all moved away. Bangkok came up with a plan some time ago, was it in 2004 or five? and, the, you know, where the king said, that, uh, you know, he, uh, th that if you produce power in your house, he will pay you 25% more than you will be charged for energy that, uh, you know, you buy from the grid. He called it negawatt. The world calls it negawatt these days. Toronto has come up with a law recently in January this year where every building that has over 2,000 square meters, be it commercial or residential, has to have rooftop harvesting. You need to grow your own vegetables or whatever. If you refuse to do that, the council decides to give this away as a contract to somebody who specializes in this and wants to do it. Philadelphia is looking at one such plan. It's a city of no more than 1.2 million people. They call it the Green Infrastructure Plan, GIP 2025. Cities like Hyderabad, cities like Bangalore can easily do this. You don't represent any more than about a million or million and quarter households. You are about seven to eight million people. We are about 10 million people in Bangalore. You're looking at about 14 million in Bombay. The densities are healthier in Bombay at about 600 to 700. While in cities like this, because of the spread and because of possibly, you know, faster growth that uh, Hyderabad or Bangalore has had in the last 15 years, you haven't seen the kind of organic growth that, uh, you know, uh, and, and organic and yet planned growth that Bombay saw uh, between uh, 1990 and, say, 2000, uh, in the first phase of such uh, growth that the Indian economy saw. Uh, these are very simple things that we all can do. And I keep telling people, don't even make green buildings. All you need to do is to see if you can get to fixing these things in your homes in three, broadly three areas, energy, water, and waste. In water, there are three components that you need to work on, and you can do it as a retrofit in your existing home. The other is, uh, on energy, you need to look at only three things, um, two things, pumps, if you can, you know, chuck the one that you have got for the last, say, 10 years and put in something that's energy efficient, you, you will gain that money back in less than two years, given tariffs of the kind that your city has got today at about eight and a half rupees per unit. Andhavad has the same tariff that you have. Trivandrum has the same tariff as you have. You got this tariff of eight rupees plus during Mr. Naidu's uh, regime. In Karnataka, we pay less than four rupees per unit, yet amortization happens faster. There is, there is, there is room for 
technologies are, you know, are taking in of technologies, when you have such costs rationalized, especially for energy and water. That's not happening across the country, we know this. And there is this huge inequity between what you pay inside cities and what you pay outside. You can walk, you can go some 40 kilometers off a, a city like Ahmedabad or Broda, and you'll see people paying 300 rupees for two buckets of, two 20 liter buckets of water. And with rules and, you know, governing their usage. So water is going to, and we are on the top of the list when it comes to water crisis in India. I mean, across the world, that is. Um, contract load. You know, most households have more than six to eight kilowatts of contract load that we have taken thoughtlessly. All you're saying is, try and find a way. You could do it in existing homes. We're not suggesting that you compromise on your comfort and convenience. All you need to do is to find a smart energy consultant who will work this around, work this for you in a way that, you know, one half of your grid, the local grid that is of your household, goes on something that's renewable. Could be solar, which is the easiest option if you're looking at something that you want to do at a single household. It could be something that you want to do at a community level and where the renewable energy options get better. Treating wet waste. You know, in a city like Bangalore, I don't know the figures in your city, we've got something like 4,000 tons of waste that comes every day spewing out of homes. 70% of that is wet waste. Wet waste, because, it's, because of moisture content, is heavier. Now, if there is a way we kind of govern ourselves or get it legislated to see that we keep such wet waste inside our homes, compost them, use it either ourselves for those rooftop harvest systems that you all need to be going in for, or you sell them. Look at these things. This is something I keep telling our people inside the office. Ah, there. One ton of steel is 300 tons of raw earth, 100 tons of iron ore to be smelted. We are not even talking of the energy that those furnaces will use. One megawatt of energy at any thermal plant means half a million kilo of coal. It's actually nearly 0.7 million tons. And 30% of that is fly ash. You have to go to any of these thermal plants to see for yourself what happens. And if you are an architect or somebody who is an engineer designing, creating things, I would want you to actually go and see what happens every time you flip the switch inside your home or office. Because, you know, if we don't make that connect between what we actually use here as urbans to those things that we destroy as, ecos as uh, resources of natural ecosystems, I think we won't get anywhere with our planning or with our actions. And no government can do anything about this. The one force that can make that change will be consumer preference. And if that's driven from the marketplace, whoever it is on the other side of the table has to bring change. And if you, if you actually look at something like this, you'll realize that one unit saved is 10 units that you don't have to actually generate. Today, India is producing or has at least the capacity to produce about 170,000 megawatts. New York City alone has a capacity of 110,000 megawatts. And Tokyo is somewhere close to that same figure. So we are much better off than those countries in terms of the amount of generation that we're doing today. But we are caught in this predicament. You know, in, 19, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the age of innocence, as they call it, between 1950 and 70, we didn't realize what the world was going through. Until 1984 or 1987, we didn't really know that there was something called the ozone hole. As only now, between 2000 and 2010, that we have rapidly begun to see the direct impact of what we are making on the rest of the planet. And so, unfortunately, we're caught in this kind of a cleft stick where we need growth and we need, you know, the kind of um, growth in, uh, what is it called, uh, the, 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 the pace on uh, GDP itself. But is this how we want to do it is the question. Someone was talking earlier about growth and development. I think there's a significant, you know, shift in meaning that we all need to understand. We don't need growth at the cost of development. What is quality of life and what is, uh, you know, economic prosperity is something that we need to actually begin to ask ourselves and see what we will get as solutions. While we will not want to compromise convenience or, or, or any of those definitions of urban lifestyle itself. Can we disrupt? This is another question we keep asking ourselves. You know, if you asked questions of this kind, 100,000 square feet, how much will it weigh? What can I do to reduce it in terms of the tonnage of the building? For instance, today for us, a 10,000 square meter building or 100,000 square feet, 
you know, cost us about 44,000 carbon tons. The regular building costs about 66 or 67,000 tons. That's about a third on a regular building. Now, can we put that down to 50% from where we are today is a question that we are asking within the organization that I represent. A small house, 2,000 square feet, 1,500 to 1,800 square feet, will cost you about 280 tons of materials that you import into that place. What can you do about these things? Can you set some goals if you are leaders in your companies and tell them, you know, what I write down there on that, on that last part? Uh, can we stop using riverbed sand? Most of us know that, you know, seashore sand can't be used for construction. One of those marvels of nature. Some things you can't use, some things you can. And we're killing our riverbeds. You know, one million square feet is something like one square kilometer at 0.5 meter of sand that we are excavating from these riverbeds. Sand mining will get banned soon. I don't know how soon. It's not become law in many, many parts. And it's not a central law. This is something that has to be done at the state level or sometimes at the, at the local levels of administration. Can we build cement? Can we stop using cement for these things? Can we cut use of steel? Can we stop using bricks and concrete? Can we stop using glass? Just now, last week, there was a law. Uh, I think it's the fire department at the union level. Somebody is saying, hey, we are not going to give you sanctions anymore if you've got these glass facades for buildings. Because, you know, they heat up the building by at least 7 degrees delta. Can we aim at creating offices, homes and hotels and whatever? I call it H3O actually, homes, hospitals, hotels and offices with this kind of system. We have built 150 houses, apartments, some, in another case about 140 villas in one gated community. We have no water supply board, we have no sewerage board connections, we have only about 20% that we take from the grid because the grid lies there. If you didn't have the grid, we would have gone net zero on it. When you have the grid, it's useful for you to use it in the non-peak load hours we found. We have now gone to, you know, to these directions. We are tr trying to look at how, for instance, you know, we can collect urine, 10,000 liters, put in some water, use that as some kind of a fertilizer. There is there's one institution in Trichy which, uh, which used it, south there. And uh, they have come up with some exceedingly successful results in the last five years. So we are trying to see how we could do. We started one model like this about 40 kilometers north of Bangalore working well to a point where the villages have now decided that they will want, you know, two, one more bus stop to be set up in that town in order to see, I mean, one more toilet, public toilet to be set up in that, uh, in that area near the bus stand in order to see that people will, you know, will piss and collect more urine. Uh, the farmers there, there are about 6,000 farmers in Dodbalapur area who have decided to see that they will shift from using, you know, the, the synthetic fertilizers to fertilizers of this kind. Uh, rooftop harvesting is another. Doshi showed it in the Mumbai Port Trust at 400 square feet. You get about 5 kg every day for 300 days a year with a crop cycle of about 40 to 60 days. If you put your head to it, you could, you could you know, do things like these for instance, you know, solar distillers. It's available. You need to see how you get a smart guy who, who can engineer some system as a collector panel goes. 80 liters of seawater, 15 liters of distilled water. I mean, any of these coastal parts can offer markets for these things at as little as 7,500 to 10,000 rupees with profit margins of about 30% on it. Air to water systems, where the, the humidity is higher, you can generate up to 1,000 liters per day on a system which is no more than a cubic meter, you know, as volume goes. Refrigerators at about a third of its current uh, energy consumption. There's a guy from Australia who has come up with a system which opens top end and he's designed it so well that you get access to the different, uh, you know, uh, parts of that system. And it, it's costing him 90% less his energy because cold air stays at the bottom. It's only the hot air that it escapes every time you open it at the top. Look at this. This is all composite systems for roofing. You know, they save you about 40% on cost. They last you, you know, five times more than regular roofing materials. The construction industry, infrastructure is a four-letter word in countries like ours and China. Because you know, you're not going to get away from the fact that you're going to have nearly 30% of your GDP being spent on construction into the next 10 years. You can do many things. Like look at these blocks. They don't use cement at all in their, in their uh, uh, bonding, completely without, without sand and completely without cement, but it's bonded in a way that can last 70 years. The customer wants reliability, he wants economy, he wants efficiency, he wants good finishes. 
and he wants his function to be served. You get all of that there. I don't know if they make for a set of ideas, but what they do actually is to try and tell you that we can't actually con constantly have this, you know, set of bad news coming our way on what is happening to the planet. If there are some individual ways that we can evolve to see that we uh, shift the conversation and have simple things that are economically efficient and yet economically compatible, I think we'll be, you know, getting on and getting ahead in some smarter ways. Thank you for listening to me.